Hello and welcome. My name is Moritz Neun, and I'm happy to welcome you here to the Traffic Forecast 2021 special session. Thanks for joining, and also a great thank you to all the participants for their submissions and insightful solutions. Looking forward to learn more about them today. Let me now hand over to Michael Kopp, who will be the chair for the first session today. Thanks very much. Also for my side, I'm very happy that we are hosting this special session and that we have a great program, which I'll introduce right away. So first of all, um, uh, Sepp Hochreiter, a true pioneer of machine learning, will introduce the competition. I'm then very much looking forward to Johannes Brandstetter's talk on physics, molecules, and PDE modeling using graph neural networks, which will have a, a, a link also to, to traffic. Christian Eichenberger will then introduce you to our competition design and data, which is then followed by talks from winning teams uh, of the core and extended challenge. So Sungbin Choi, who uh, was second uh, in the core challenge and first in the extended challenge, will present his solution, followed by um, Vaswald Konyakin, Nila Lushinka, and Alexei Spielmann, um, who had the third prize in our uh, core competition. And lastly, Nina Wiedmann and Martin Raubol um, uh, present their um, a solution for the third prize of the extended challenge. It's then followed by the submission of large scale traffic prediction using 3D ResNet and sparse UNet. Um, and last but not least, we will award the special prizes. So without further ado, uh, let's uh, move over to a true pioneer in machine learning. He's the first to identify it, the vanishing gradient phenomenon invented uh, uh, long short-term memories, made seminal contributions to meta-learning, reinforcement learning, and has recently also introduced modern hotfield networks, which are essentially differentiable network layers that can act as efficient associative memories. Um, he's a professor at the Johannes Kepler University in Linz, heads the LIT AI lab there, and is also a co-founder of our institute, IRA. Without further ado, Sepp, I yield the floor to you. Hello, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, a warm welcome from my side uh, to the traffic forecast. Uh, this year uh, uh, version, uh, you know, it was already successful in 2019, in 2010, uh, 20. And uh, thanks also to Michael for this kind introduction. I'm very honored. Uh, traffic forecast uh, 2021 uh, uh, version. Uh, uh, again, as in previous years, it's about multimodal traffic map movie forecasting. Uh, so traffic data was uh, rendered as a movie. It was very successful in Europe uh, 2019, in Europe 2020, and uh, it is also successful this year. Uh, Traffic. traffic is one of the big problems of humanities, and we are trying to help tackle one of uh, humanity's largest problems by using machine learning. Traffic forecast. Uh, why is it such a big problem for humanity? Uh, it's about the urbanization. Uh, uh, all the big cities uh, suffer from uh, traffic congestion, uh, which is uh, Obvious in all urban areas, uh, but still, people, uh, uh, citizens of the cities, should be allowed uh, to stay mobile, uh, uh, to travel around. Uh, on the other hand, there's this environmental concerns like air pollution, uh, climate change, uh, also, this uh, big uh, issues, uh, big problems we have to think of if we think about traffic. And we should avoid economic losses and, of course, uh, unnecessary waste of fuel. This is a big uh, problem we want to tackle, and we want to tackle it by machine learning methods. Uh, goals are uh, minimizing the negative environmental and social impacts of traffic. Uh, traffic is such a central uh, 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 thing in our uh, uh, life these days, we want to move from one uh, uh, position to another position, uh, like we go from home to office, and everybody of us that's doing this, at COVID perhaps not, but uh, later, 
and that is a very essential uh, uh, thing uh, to move around in your city. We want to advance, adapt, and apply modern machine learning techniques uh, to optimize uh, traffic or to construct uh, traffic control systems and to understand uh, understand complex systems like traffic. Uh, as I already said, the data are high resolution trajectories mapped to uh, uh, spatial temporal uh, uh, cells, uh, uh, patches, uh, and they are summarized as a movie. Uh, we looked at different cities across the world, also uh, at different times. Uh, uh, this task is more a scene completion task, or you can also uh, cast it as a prediction uh, task where you have uh, to be very robust. And uh, it is also a few short learning task. The data looks like this. Uh, we have a volume, how many cars are on the streets, the speed, how fast does it drive, and so direction. And this is uh, three uh, uh, channels, and the three channels can be put together in an RGB frame, like, you know, from, from images. And this uh, here on the lower right is an RBG frame. Uh, here's an example of Berlin, Berlin uh, city in uh, Europe. Uh, where you see the traffic at different uh, times. And if you uh, look closer, you see uh, uh, changes, you see uh, different behavior, different streets uh, coming up uh, and uh, different regions uh, 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 having more traffic than others. And what's very interesting, especially also uh, this year, a traffic forecast has all this uh, data, this measurement data, but there's also some symbolic data, symbolic data in terms of a street network, uh, in terms of a graph neural, neural network. Uh, uh, here uh, you can apply uh, modern techniques. Uh, uh, I know in most cases UNET uh, uh, is applied, but UNET would be a special case of a graph neural network. And here it's about integrating uh, symbolic data into sub-symbolic methods or uh, in sub-symbolic measurements. So that's a big challenge. You have the symbolic data, the map, and you have sub-symbolic uh, methods and sub-symbolic measurements, uh, so traffic volume, direction, and so on. This year's traffic forecast uh, competition is about domain shift in future learning. So it's very central uh, research topics uh, these days in machine learning. And we looked at, in the traffic forecast 2021, at domain shifts in space and time. Training was uh, uh, provided for, uh, training data was provided for four cities with symbolic information uh, uh, given by roadmap, roadmaps. And uh, yes, there were two uh, major challenges. The core challenge was uh, to predict after temporal uh, domain shift in traffic. It's a domain shift was due to uh, COVID-19. Uh, um, before COVID-19 and during COVID-19, uh, the traffic behavior and the traffic data looked differently. Question is, can we, Generalize and sets out of this distribution generalization from what we learned about traffic in a, a normal situation in this uh, exceptional situation uh, in COVID. Because uh, uh, guys stayed at home, could not go to work, there were, were lockdowns, all these kind of things. Did we learn enough about traffic to be also good in COVID times? And the, uh, uh, the goal was to predict as so a dynamic traffic after 5, 10, 15, 30, uh, 45, and 60 minutes. Uh, to look only a couple of minutes into the future, uh, up to one hour in the future. So there was another challenge. This was extended uh, 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 challenge. It's also about uh, uh, future learning, about uh, uh, multitask learning. Uh, and here the goal was to predict the, the, the traffic dynamics for uh, two new cities, which were not uh, given in the training data, since we are new cities, 
the uh, challenge was, can I learn traffic dynamics? Can I learn how traffic uh, 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 processes, how uh, the traffic rules uh, on these four cities? And can I transfer this knowledge to the two new cities, which were uh, not known, no data was given for the two new cities. And for the new cities, only the test input we are given. We are even the year uh, uh, was hidden. You, uh, uh, you didn't even know what year it is. Is it during COVID or not COVID? And uh, the static maps were given. Uh, this symbolic data was given. And the big challenge were, uh, of course, few short learning challenges. You have only few data uh, for the new situations. Can I adapt? adjust my model uh, to uh, uh, this new situation, given only a few uh, data, it's a very uh, uh, hot topic now in machine learning. Can I build robust models? Because uh, uh, traffic uh, is affected by weather condition, congestions, uh, accidents, or other events, uh, like a soccer game, like if uh, Bayern Munich would play Barcelona, and guys go out of the stadium. It's not uh, these days because it's COVID, but uh, without COVID, these events or a concert can have effects and the model should be robust uh, even if these events occur. We uh, have to include symbolic knowledge, give me as roadmaps. Uh, uh, this is a, a, a complex spatial process or a spatial temporal process uh, we try to build models for uh, uh, analyzing and uh, modeling this uh, special temporal process. And also importantly, we want to uh, be adaptive to domain shifts, to changes, both in space, going to different cities, and time, going from non-COVID times to COVID times. And I want to thank all participants uh, for getting involved, for doing all this work. Uh, for creating some models and doing this uh, uh, predictions. We were very uh, uh, surprised and very uh, uh, fascinated how good these predictions uh, were. And I want to thank you. I'm looking forward now uh, uh, to the talk of Johannes Brandstetter. Uh, I'm very excited about this talk and I was I couldn't sleep the whole night because I looked forward to this talk. Thank to all of you. Bye bye. Well, thank you very much, Seb. That was that that was great. Um, I I couldn't sleep either, and I have palpitations even introducing him. So um, actually, the talk's uh, title is Physics, Molecules, and PDE Modeling Using Graph Neural Networks. Um, but first, let me maybe introduce Johannes. Johannes is a senior researcher with a history of working and publishing in machine learning and high energy physics. During his PhD, he was involved at the CMS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, working on Higgs boson physics. Currently, Johannes is a tenure track professor at the JKU, so Johannes Kepler University in Linz, uh, in, in a group headed by SEP. And he's an Ellis Fellow in the Amsterdam Machine Learning Lab in a group uh, headed by Max Welling. His research comprises modeling of physics, processes, and simulations, developing general and uh, fully neural solvers of partial differential equations, and modeling molecular properties and dynamics. I personally was mostly bowled over by the, his paper on steerable E3 equivariant uh, GNNs, and maybe there's something in that talk. Johannes assured me beforehand that there is actually a very strong connection, as there would be, uh, with graphs to traffic. So um, I will now uh, release everyone's tension and let hand over the floor to Johannes and uh, very much looking forward to that. Thank you very, very much for this, this, this very kind introduction, both from, from, from Sepp and from Michael. I feel, feel very honored, honored, but also a bit pressured now. Um, so as, uh, as Michael said already, the, the talk or the title of my talk is, is Physics, Molecules and PDE Modeling. Um, nevertheless, these are or the, the techniques we use nowadays to, to tackle this challenge are very um, transferable, also especially as we will see in the, in the end to, to traffic problems. Um, and and most, mostly if you, or most notably if you see traffic data as, as graphs moving over time. 
Sepp uh, already mentioned that most of the research or most of the successful applications for this year's challenge were done by, um, by, by ResNet unit and other confident architectures. So it's very important for me to draw the connection between um, graph networks and convolution networks in the very beginning, and then basically um, to get give you a feeling which which challenges can be tackled by both, where convolution networks might function better and where graph networks function better. So this talk at some point is a bit technical because I try to split up um, the whole dynamical systems. Um, which I will talking about into a Lanchemin viewpoint into a, and into a Fokker-Blanc viewpoint. I will explain these two viewpoints in more detail in a few slides, but in order to, to be equipped um, with the prerequisites for these viewpoints, I need to introduce graph neural networks, I need to introduce the concept of equivariance, and then of course I need to introduce Lanchemin and Fokker-Blanc equations. What the Lanchemin viewpoint allows us is to model dynamical systems where particles move around, where you can do physics simulation, or you can do chemi chemical simulation. What the Fokker-Blank viewpoint allows us is to do mesh-based simulation, like um, solving partial differential equations or solving like um, heat transformation of materials and, and, and that kind of stuff. So these are the two um, major um, distinctions I'm making in this talk, and I will try to connect these two these two points and the, the papers I will present while going through them. So I've mentioned already the, 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 the wording dynamical system. Dynamical system is a bit uh, a new emerging trend in the whole deep learning community. It's for me personally, it has the, the whole, uh, it, it has a, um, the potential of, of impact like computer vision and speech and reinforcement learning heads because it's describing how things move. And we are all know that in deep learning, we kind of criminally neglect the time domain. So we are very good at predicting images, um, recognizing faces, um, recognizing objects, translating speech and so on and so forth. But if things move over time, if systems evolve over time, everything gets very complex, very fast. But we are now at the, at the stage from the, the model wise and from the compute wise where we can tackle like the biggest challenges, how, how proteins bind, how molecules move, how traffic is moving, how fluids move and so on and so forth. This goes from like really traffic data and uh, down to, to quantum simulations. And all these this, this things together um, are, a coin in, in the name of dynamical systems. And this is basically what I was talking about. Um, dynamical systems are very, very closely related to the concept of geometric deep learning, which is a term coined by, by Michael Bronstein and his colleagues. Um, it comes from, from research directions of, of graph networks, um, group theory, um, grid theory, and everything which comes together with, with gauges and geodesics and, and, and all these um, um, theories from, from, from physics. And the, the idea of geometric deep learning is to really use the, the inductive bias, which is in your data, bias given by symmetries, by gauges, to, to incorporate into, into your models. You can do this as, as Tucker Cohen was the first in 2016, by really plugging in the, the symmetry groups of your data into his equivariant neural networks. You can do this, for example, by graphs, by modeling the, the structure of molecules, by this designing the graphs, and so on and so forth. The, the three Gs of geometric deep learning um, I will talk about today is, of course, graphs and grids, which are very closely related. Grids are basically regular graphs, and the concept of groups, which can be applied to both of them. So we are already now at the stage where we can introduce graph neural networks and graph data is really ubiquitous. You, you see it everywhere from, from molecules, from, from traffic data, but also if you look at images, because graph is nothing else than nodes which are collect, connected by edges. So that we see here some nodes and we can collect, connect them with edges. And this um, specifies a graph. Um, in the 
concept of graph neural networks, there is one um, concept which is called message passing, which is the, the, the strongest um, way of training graph neural networks. So we'll mainly focus on, on message passing algorithms. Today, message passing means that if we start on the on the right, we have a central node here, and this node exchanges messages with the surrounding node. So every node sends an incoming message, and this node co collects all these messages to be updated. This is very similar to a convolution, because if you convolve your image with a filter, you do nothing else than, um, than collecting the information of neighboring cells. The only difference is that that uh, convolution filter basically collects the the average information of of the cells or of the of the grid uh, upon which it is slided, whereas the the graph networks really updates every every node by the the aggregated information. And so you can basically replace every CNN with the graph neural network, but you cannot do it vice versa. Of course, replacing a CNN with the graph neural network on image data doesn't work so well because CNNs have um, automatically this inductive bias that points are equally distant away and so on and so forth. So they are really built to work very well and, and graph networks have to learn um, to, to, to work with these um, distances. But whenever data is not equidistant and, and when data comes with a different structure, a different underlying graphs, a graph graph networks are the, the tool to, to choose nowadays. And I already said the name message passing networks, the, the concept of, of, of messages, which are a model by a function was introduced by Gilman like four years ago. What is happening here? If we, we, we consider on the right side of this graph where we have this, this red atom, which is a, um, a hydrogen atom and this blue atom, which is a um, a nitrogen, a, a carbon atom, and this, this green one, which is, uh, um, I don't know. But what is what is going on is um, that, that the green atom collects the information from the yellow, the, the red, and the blue atom. And how this information is collected? First, by, by looking at all these, these different um, connections, so from yellow to green, from green to blue, and from green to red and putting this information into a so-called message network. So this is the message network, which shares weight upon all ages in the graph. So all these, these ages go through the same message passing network, but um, of course, this, this message passing network have different inputs, namely the red and the blue, uh, the red and the green for, for this connection or the green and the blue for this connection. After we have um, obtained messages, we then aggregate these messages in this green node. So all the incoming messages are aggregated by summing them up or taking a maximum or another aggregation method. And finally, we apply an update network, which updates the information of this green node. This is, these are the steps from, from message passing layers and everything which I described um, here makes up one message passing layer. So one message passing layer basically has two small networks inside and every network shares parameters about for all ages, for all edges in one graph, the, the, the uh, message network and for all node updates for, for all the nodes. The next um, theoretical um, 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 prerequisite we have to tackle is group theory. Group theory is, is nowadays one of the driving forces of deep learning, just from arising from the fact that the data we are looking at is coming with lots of symmetries inside. And the, the nice thing about the symmetries is that, that we can describe symmetries, that we can mathematically model them. And the, the, the symmetries, like the continuous symmetries, um, are modeled by so-called Lie groups. They are Lie symmetries. What does continuous mean? If you look at the rotation, you can basically do any infinitesimal rotation um, and you still have formed a uh, action of your symmetry. So, so you have transformed any object given to your um, symmetry group. 
You can do the same for translation. If you think of a car moving forward, any infinitesimal moving forward can be interpreted as action of your symmetry group. Um, this, this, this Lie groups, basically um, the, the, the um, representation of these Lie groups, they, they lie on a, on a differentiable manifold. That's the connection to, um, this is how we describe the symmetries. And examples I already gave a few, like translation, rotation, and scaling. And how we, we how these symmetries are related to our data is that every data or the data points basically can be generated by symmetry transformation, which are called group actions. What does this mean? If we look at this ballet dancer, we can apply a translation symmetry to this dancer and move this dancer to the right. And that's uh, um, the, the group action of a translation symmetry. We can, of course, also rotate this, this ballet dancer, and then we would have seen here a, a rotated um, version of our dancer. And very, very closely to, related to the concept of equivariance, uh, to symmetries is the concept of equivariance, because equivariance is a property of a function with respect to the symmetry. It means that um, if we transform the input of a function, it should give you the same result as transforming the output of the function. Um, and this, of course, you can think of the, the transformation of a of a translation. So if you translate the input, it should give you the same result as translating the output. You can rotate the input, it should give you the same result as rotate the, the output. And again, if you look at our dancer, if we move our dancer to the, to the right and then apply the function to it, which is in that case, a filter map of a CNN, it should be the same as applying the, the function to the dancer in the first place and then um, putting it through our function. So in that case, we, we have achieved equivariance. And one of the most famous examples for equivariance are CNNs because they're translation equivariant. No matter if the, the input is in the middle or the right, also the filter maps are connected with, with such a transformation. And that's the, that's the, the, the reason, one of the reasons why CNNs um, perform so well on, 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 on um, image data and outperform all um, MLP approaches. But of course, data comes with, with more symmetries than just translation. And therefore, the, one of the tasks or one of the goals in many of the architectures I will talk now is, is how to, to use um, this, this transformation, this, this other symmetry groups to put into your deep learning architectures. There is just one subtlety I want to, to say. Um, I get often the question, if we, if we um, classify an image, Basically, we have an invariance because no matter where the, where the object is in my image, I get out cat or dog or whatsoever. And cat or dog is not, you cannot apply as a, a transformation on, on, on the output cat or dog. So what is, what is going on here is that there's a, a special case of equivariance. And that is when, when the, the guy here is the identity because then no matter how we transform the input, we get the same output. And in a convolution network, what is really happening is that all the convolution layers in the, from the beginning to the end satisfy this equivariance property. Only the last output layer, which maps the, the final um, filter map to the, to the output um, has the invariant property. So no matter where, where your input is, it will give you the, the output. That's the connection between invariance and equivariance. And with that, we come to the last point of my, my introduction, and this is the probably for today the most important viewpoint, and that's the difference be between Langevin and Fokker-Planck view. This, uh, this is like a, a viewpoint which, which kind of I have made up, but, but it helps me to, to understand and put the different models into, into perspective, and this is also how, how I want to introduce it today. Um, what the Langevin dynamics do, or Langevin equations do, they are stochastic differential equations, and they describe a particle level, uh, a system at particle level viewpoint. So you can think of some Brownian motion where you have a particle starting here, and this particle undergoes some stochastic um, movement. So there is some force um, dragging this particle to the upper right, but it's the stochasticity which gives this particle this weird path which, which it is following. And um, so the, the Lachemin, dynamics really operate on a particle 
point of view. So the particles are moving and um, the particle positions are updated for every, every few point. The, diff, uh, or the, the opposite is the Fokker-Planck point of view, which is also a partial differential equation, but this time it's not stochastic, but it is, describes the probability density function. Like that the Schrodinger equation can be seen as Fokker-Planck equation. Um, you can write that the whole procedure here with probabilities of particles starting here to particles starting here. Of course, in the, in the beginning, you have something like the, the blue curve, so a very sharp peak, which, which tells you that the probability is, 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 is very um, centered around the starting position. And then when the, when the particle moves, the probabilities also move, but they smear out because the probability, or it's harder to tackle um, the exact position of a particle because there's so much stochasticity in the, in the, in the particle. In statistical physics, you can convert Lachemin in equations into Fokker-Planck equation and vice versa. On machine learning point of view, um, Lachemin equation means that we have particles which move around like in the wild and Fokker-Planck means that we have a mesh which is kind of fixed and our, our values of the mesh will be updated. So that's the, the probability density which changes over time. And we will start now with Langevin dynamics viewpoint. For the Langevin dynamics viewpoint, I like there are many, many, many examples. It can be planetary movement, it can be atom movements, it can be like molecules, as I already, already showed you, which are rotating and moving in, in time or binding to other um, molecules. But it can also be some, some granular flow where we have lots of data points, which are all particles, and we want to update the particle, the microscopic particle, to get the macroscopic behavior. So these are very different. Um, very different problems, but they are very closely co connected by, um, by the, the, the idea that every particle um, is moving and we model the interaction of this particle. I think you, you guessed it already. If you, if you want to, to plug in traffic here, um, what is going on, you can, for example, attach uh, uh, like positions to, to every car or every bus or every, um, every other system in, in, in in, in the traffic and model its, its um, behavior. That's the, the Lachemin dynamics viewpoint of, of how one could in principle model traffic. One of the, the seminal papers in this, this area was from Sanchez Gonzalez at, at, at colleagues. Um, what they did is they, they simulated this, this dynamics of, 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 of water and sand um, by breaking it down to particle-particle interactions. And there are four very important points to, to say, which we will um, encounter in the, in the following examples um, or in the following slides um, all over again. So the first is we have particle-particle interaction. That's, that's completely um, what is going on when, when you talk about Lachemin viewpoint, you model the particle-particle interactions. You embed this as a graph, which is kind of natural, and you use a cutoff radius, which is also kind of natural because physics tells you where to, to put your, your cutoff radius. Particles which are close by should be connected. Particles which are far apart should not be connected. And you predict the acceleration at the next time point t plus one. And you use this acceleration to update your, your velocity and interposition. So that the update of the, um, and that's very important, the update of the um, acceleration uh, the, the update of the position is done in a, in, in a kind of hybrid way. The neural network predicts you the acceleration. A semi-implicit method gives you the, the, the next um, um, position, up, uh, position points. Um, what is also to say, if we look at, at, at this, this um, nice um, figures from the paper, we see that basically they, they put their main focus on particle-particle interaction. So particle-particle interaction should be modeled very, very nicely. But in real world, we often have different problems. Like um, if, we, if we look at this, this drum, um, which is well in, in, in nowadays engineering, I think everyone has, has seen a rotating drum or in this, this, this hopper, which is also very, um, often used in, in, in agriculture and farming. So 
in that in in these um, in, under these settings, this this particle particle viewpoint is 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 very nice. But the the problem is that you interact with 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 the walls, and and the interaction with the walls is far non-trivial. Um, so in 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 this um, paper, which was um, led by an Andreas Meyer, and, and he did, did an enormous effort to to translate basically the, the work from Sanchez and Gonzalez into this new setting. Um, we came to the to the problem that these triangularized boundaries they are abandoned, but they're extremely hard to model. So the, the first thing we did is we we densely sampled all these 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 regions, but we very fastly ran into a computational overload. So the idea was we needed some kind of effective theory. Effective theory is in physics a theory which breaks down a very very complex system of equation into these kind of equations which are enough to describe the system at hand. So this is an effective theory and we wanted to do the same. We want to um, describe the, the interaction with the boundary surface with an effective theory. So very effectively, we, we, we needed as few particles as possible to sample these boundary um, conditions or this, this, this boundary surface areas. And let's start with um, some, some initial um, um, trials where our model was already pretty good because we, we, we used the, the, the SOTA models at hand and we were really, really good at modeling particle-particle interactions. So the particle-particle interactions made, completely made sense. But what was a horror to model was the particle-wall interaction. This is exactly where we needed a, a new effective theory which took care of, 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 of how of how does this particle interact with the wall. We did this by generating a on the fly effective graphs which take um, the, the interaction with the, with the wall into account on a, on a particle wall interaction level. Um, it was very important for us to not use any handcrafted conditions or restrictions because this should be generally applicable. And very nicely after like lots of, lots of um, trials, we really model, were able to model um, and find a general way of how to describe these particles for settings where, where basically you have very complex geometric boundaries. The, if, you, if you look at these at this, um, um, at this, at this problems, you, what you see here is, is something rotating. And, and you can guess it, there is a lot of symmetry in this data because particles um, have a rotation symmetry. There's also a translation symmetry and there are probably other symmetries as well. So I will next talk about two ways of how one can approach um, such symmetries or how can incorporate such symmetries into dynamical systems. The first is a paper which was presented at this near's NeurIPS from, from my colleagues, um, Miltos Kovenas um, and, um, and, and Stratis Gaves. They were, were looking at local coordinate frames for interacting systems. So this is an example of an interacting system they considered in their paper. You guessed it, we have traffic data and they model this traffic data with graphs. So every um, car and every truck is represented by a node. And um, if we, we set our coordinate system here at the crossing, the idea was for every, for every um, node node interaction, we, we move the coordinate system such that, that, that the node at hand is in the, in the origin of our coordinate system. So we move the coordinate system individually for every node such that for when you calculate messages for every node, these messages are calculated from the origin. This is of course different for every, um, for every of the participants. So we operate in an egocentric perspective. So the objects are moved um, to, to, to the, the, the respective, um, or the, the, the object are moved to the, to the origin, but the graph as a whole stays in the global coordinate frame. So let's, let's try uh, with this example here. So we can think of this, this, this white car as, as being this, this um, yellow dot. So for calculating interactions for this yellow dot, we, we move the, the, the yellow dot into the origin. So we move this, this white car into the origin of our system. And this means that all other cars are of course also translated and rotated with the same, um, same group actions. In a, um, oh, that is unfortunate. 
So I hope you can still see it. Basically, we see um, a, the, the graph which operates in four different um, coordinate systems. So in in this coordinate system, the, the blue part is moved to the origin. I'm sorry that the, the GIF doesn't play out well. In this part, the, and the darker blue one is moved into the um, origin. In, that, in, 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 this, um, in this graph, the, the yellow is, is, is moved into the origin. In this part, the, the red is moved into the origin. So every interaction for, 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 um, for the nodes takes place in their own um, local frame centered at the origin. And that's a very neat approach to, to, to model such, um, such dynamical system and it works extremely well. Um, and they, they basically tackle the hole in a variation setting, which is, which is quite common that the encoder basically learns the connections and the decoder, decoder learns um, to, to predict the next state. Another approach one can do is, is you, you can um, embed everything or you can embed this, the symmetries of, of translation and rotation into, into one network um, with, with one go. Um, this, is a, this is a paper I've done with my colleagues here in, in Amsterdam. What we try to do is, is achieve E3 equivariance, which is very common in, in, in nowadays graph neural network approaches, which means equivariance with respect to, to translation, rotations, and reflections. Um, what our goal was, because looking at, at chemical and, 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 and quantum chemical data, I mean, also at um, planetary data and at, at, at other like physical data, we realized that there's a lot of um, vector valued inputs. So for example, you can have spin, you can have force, you can have speed, you can have momentum, acceleration, and you have all this kind of data which you want to embed in your, in your nodes. And the, the problem is if you have equivariance um, with respect to, to like atoms or atom number, it's very easy to embed it if you rotate the graph that the information stays the same or rotates um, accordingly. But what happens if you have a spin or a force vector attached to, to the graph, you rotate it and, and, the graph and the spin and force vector do not rotate accordingly. And this is a main problem because you lose um, the, the power of, of generalizing to these this rotated um, inputs. And, and therefore, we can think of it as, as having a, a graph here, which is, has attached some, some, um, some uh, vector valued quantities um, represented as spheric harmonics, uh, which are these, these nice blobs here. And if you rotate this graph and then put it to, to your function, it should be the same as putting it to your function first and then rotating it. And, and that was the goal. And we modeled that by so-called steerable features, steerable vector spaces, and steerable MLPs. The whole um, field of steerability is, is a big field in, 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 the, in the field of equivariance itself. Um, I will just very loosely introduce the concept. Steerability means with respect to a certain group that you can apply the group action by a matrix vector multiplication. For example, very loosely speaking, if you're in the 3D case um, and you want to ro rotate, it's very easy. You use a 3D rotation matrix, a three times three rotation matrix, and you can rotate your input. However, if you are in a, in a high dimensional space, it's very hard to apply a rotation matrix to, to your input. So you have to operate in a space where this, this, this rotations and this translation can be generated by matrix um, vector multiplication. And, and this works by lifting everything to the, to the basis of the spherical harmonics and the, the, the lifting or the, the, the difference from, from going from a Euclidean space to, to the base of spherical harmonics as the so-called intertweeners. And then we operate in the, this space of span by spherical harmonics and we map from one vector space to the other by the so-called Klebsch-Borden tensor product, which is the uh, the analogy to, to standard linear layers in, in, in neural networks. And this capture code and tensor product allowed us to, to, to generate networks which have this property that they are um, equivalent with respect to, to vectors. You can, you can look at this like this. If you have an, um, an input, you embed it in a, in a higher dimensional space, which consists of, of scalar value quantities, vector value quantities, and higher order quantities. This is the lifting in the 
in the into the layers of spent by spherical harmonics and then you can operate on this space via matrix vector multiplication so this is really a, a a rotation performed on this space and it works even for higher objects that's the, the principal idea the nice thing um, we got from from this approach is that we were able to um, to, to put all the geometric cues which we have in our data into our model. So therefore the, the, the steerable equivariant networks work very good whenever we have some, some rotational and symmetry in our data. And it works especially good when we have vector valued and tensor valued quantities. This is an example where we have an, um, an, an um, a molecule sitting on a, on a, a, a or relaxing on a on another big molecule, you can think of this, or this is actually the, from the from the open catalyst data set where the, this big um, atoms, this big molecule represents the and then the so-called um, uh, catalyst material, and then we have a very very small adsorber which we relax on this catalyst, and you you can already guess that no matter how you you um, move or how you rotate your your input, so so the the, the absorbent and the catalyst, you will have the, the same um, representation in, in our network. This is very important for, for chemistry, for example, because no matter, uh, it, the, the, the absorbent changes dramatically the, the properties of the catalyst. And therefore, when you try to search for new materials, um, you, you have to do a lot of um, screening, which, which absorbent catalyst combinations might really reduce the, the energy or the um, increased conductivity and then all these these this properties. Okay, so um, basically we can now come to the to the Fokker Planck point of view. So what, what we have done so far, let me recap. So far we really had particles which were moving. We modeled them by either um, by by either using or we, we modeled them by using graph networks which made a update in, in time. We, we later baked in all the symmetries by either going to a local coordinate frame or, or putting the, the symmetries into, into our network all at once. The second part of viewpoint is, is the, the Fokker-Planck viewpoint. So for Fokker-Planck, the particles per se do not move. So you can think of, of a, a smoke in, a, in, 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 this, in this closed room. So you have a smoke inflow and the flow info um, obeys the the, the Navier-Stokes equation and and fills out the room. You can um, you can think of this as having uh, the, the room the x y space with spanned with a grid, and every x y space has a certain value, and this value changes over time. This is exactly the Fokker-Planck view. Our grid, so to say, stays fixed, but only the values at the nodes change. So the graph we span stays fixed we don't have to dynamically generate a new graph because um, we have the same neighbors and only the, the the values change and with that the updates change over time so we we are now in the, in the um for a blank viewpoint so what we are doing basically um we there are two approaches which which i want to to talk about um, we can we can see that the whole procedure as, as operator mapping. So we have some initial condition, which can be like traffic data at 7 p.m. And we want to predict traffic data in the in the evening. It can be a partially differential equation in the in the morning. We want to predict it in the evening. Um, it can be any other physical system we we want to 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 map to. Um, this is this is basically in the literature referred to as operating mapping. I will I will. Um, um, introduce one of the most popular approaches there, or what the second choice is, we can auto aggressively model our predictions. So we, we can start in the morning, predict the next 30 minutes, use this next prediction to predict the next 30 minutes and so on and so forth. That's, that's called basically auto aggressive modeling. As, as we all know, auto aggressive modeling is harder, but it gives us the, the physical interpretability of, of our solutions. So such that we can, better infer what is what is going on with the underlying system. Um, it depends on the task, what you want. I will start with operator mapping. There's this, this, this really nice paper, um, Fourier Neural Operators, 
from, from people from Caltech and, and NVIDIA. Um, and they use this fluid neural operator to, to model partial differential equations. So their goal is really to have an initial condition and to map to solutions at given time step. So their, their, their solver should be designed such that if you start from an initial condition, you can map to any um, solution in a given range. Of course, um, this is a very tough problem and, 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 and they, they are able to do it for 30, 40 time steps, but still um, that's, that's the way of, of, of really approaching such, such problems that you basically um, stay on this, on this manifold on solutions and just go from the initial to the end point. They did this with so-called Fourier layers. Um, what we know from, from um, classical numerical solutions of partial differential equations, um, if we use, um, if we go to the Fourier space, so, so if we map from, from the position space to the Fourier space, all the derivations basically are just, um, just multiplications of the, of the exponent. And, and therefore, some um, properties are easier to, to model in the Fourier space, and then we can map back. And basically, they designed the layer such that the map in the Fourier space, then they do all these operations of the partial differential equations, meaning that the partial differential equations has to be known. That's why it's called parameter, parametric. They do all this, this operation there, and then they cut away some, some of these higher frequencies and map back into the, to the um, spatial part. That's uh, operating method. It also directly refers to partial differential equations because we have to know this, this, this partial differential equation in, in order to do, do this operator method. We next come to the recurrent approaches and they, they want to talk about two papers. Um, one is, is, is from DeepMind from, from iClear um, last year or, or, or this year. Um, it's called mesh-based simulation. So remember at the, at the beginning, I showed you the, 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 the um, the paper where, where we modeled um, physical complex systems, like the interaction of complex physical systems. Here it's very similar, but the, the difference is that we are operating now on a grid. So the particles are not free floating with the Lachemin viewpoint, but we are more on a grid using the, the Fokker Planck viewpoint. And we do still the same. We predict the accelerations at the given time point, at the, at the next time point. And we do this by uh, we use this acceleration again with some semi-simplistic method to update the position. Um, I was not like I was a bit lying when I said that the grid is not changing be because in all these these very nice simulations, um, the grids are changing. The mesh, the mess meshes are changing, but the, the graph itself is not changing. The conductivity stays the same, and and the the, the update of the nodes is is is, is very restricted such that it models that the physical system. So you can think of it if if you put a um, uh, like this. this actuator on this on this on this plate it, it pushes the plate slowly over time down and all this is captured by the, the updating of of this um, of these positions okay so that's the, the first point of view um, and and the second is is really again directly going to differential equations so now we again know the underlying differential equation and it's it's a paper from um Kokov, smith alieva van Gren, and hoyer um, it's also from, from this year, what, what they are doing, basically they, they, they operate in the same problem setting. So we, we, um, we, predict, the, the, um, we predict the acceleration here, the predict the divergence. To predict all these operators from a differential equation, you have to know how the differential equations look like. And then they use some numerical method, not an Euler scheme, but a, a more advanced scheme to make the next time update. Um, the, the difference here, the, the grid is really fixed, but, um, but the, the, like the, the values of the grid change over time. So classical um, for Kaplan. What is, what is what I want to note here, both of these methods for the time update, they use a, um, a numerical method. So the, the, the update of the, of the time is done by some numerical. So we kind of still in the, in the hybrid scheme where um, where we, we mix numerical solvers with deep neural network solvers. This brings us to, to the second part of recurrent solvers. That's a, a work done by, by me, Daniel Worrell, and, and, and Max Welling. 
Um, we, we tried to design now really solvers such that they are done fully by a neural network. So that, that everything, um, what, is, 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 what is basically putting you this autoregressive modeling is, is done by, by neural network. We chose to use graph neural networks for the, for the, the reasons that they, they offer this, this um, ability to generalize across domains, across topologies, across geometries, boundary conditions, dimensionality, and all that, that stuff. Um, the, the way we designed our graph neural networks is by looking at all these numerical solvers. So we have um, tons of solvers for, for doing spatial um, um, update. So we have this finite difference, finite val volume methods and, and, and many, many others. And we wanted to design our message passing such that these methods are representationally contained. What does this mean? It means that if you change your, your weights very accordingly, you basically end up with exactly a finite difference or a finite volume scheme. And if you change the, with the, the, the weights in a different way, you maybe end up with the Vino scheme. So our, pro, our processor, our message passing had all this, um, in theory, all these this methods reputation contained. Our decoder was um, designed such that um, we have a, a 1D convolution, which maps, which, which goes over the, the, the outputs, um, which convolves over the output, which is very similar to, to Runge Kutta method. So the representation and containment of our of a decoder is basically um, reminiscent of a, a Runge Kutta method. So that, that was basically the idea to say, okay, we really substitute the, the whole um, numerical stuff with the with a, uh, with a fully neural network solver, but such that these methods in principle are contained in, in our solver. What you have probably seen is the input is a vector and the output is a vector. So the, the nice thing about a fully neural operator, a uh, fully neural network approach allows us that we can encode many, many time step at once and outcode also many, many time step at once. If you think of all these examples I've shown you so far, it was always next time step prediction. But if we encode multiple time steps at once, we might have, we might, it might be easier for us to, to model, um, to model such, um, such autoregressive problems. Because as I told you, um, if, if in this autoregressive scheme, we update one time step after each other, and this is tremendously difficult because the noise is summed up. If we can now input many, many time steps at once in our network and output many, many time steps at once, basically have omitted this, this problem massively because the, the, the times our solver is evoked is, is drastically um, reduced. And, and yeah, so, so this suggested this, this um, smoke flow um, um, equations are just an example of, of, of how our solver worked. For me, well, one of the nicest things you, 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 you would think at the beginning that, that um, wave propagation um, with certain boundary conditions is a pretty easy problem. But it, like if you, if you try to, to put in different boundary conditions, which are not like periodic boundary condition, you need to design your numerical solvers and therefore your data such that the grid gets irregular. So we already operate an irregular grid, which is very hard, for example, convolution cannot do that. And what is also very interesting is that if we, we change this boundary condition, so if we, we have Dirichlet on one hand, which means that the wave um, bounce, bounces back by changing its, its sign, and for Neumann on the, on the other hand, which means the wave bounces back without changing its sign, it's very, very, very hard to incorporate this into our graph neural network. So basically all our solvers always fail. And then we, we, we like realized that we can put all this information about the equation. So telling the, the solver, now you have a problem where on the left hand, you, you have this boundary condition, on the right hand, you have this boundary condition. It's just two, um, two integer values put into the message passing. And this really was, was allowing us to, um, to generalize over, over different boundary conditions, but also to generalize across different equations. And that basically, brings me to, to the final outlook. So remember when we, when we were talking about Lanchemin problems, it was very obvious that, that putting the, all these symmetries into the, 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 the solvers into the graph networks were, 
what was really um, generalizing better and was really um, pushing performance to a new level. So the cases, what is happening on the, or the question is what is happening on the Fokker Blank view. Can you integrate the symmetries as well? Because there is a very nice property of, of, um, of PDEs. There is this, this, this theory of Sophos Lee. So how he even like came up with Lee group and, 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 um, and all this, um, this, this, this mathematical tools by looking at, at PDEs. And then he realized that PDEs can, can be associated with, with, um, um, with symmetry groups and every, every PDE has a certain number of symmetry groups and they, they correspond to, to Lee groups and so on and so forth. So for example, or, or concluding, if we look at PDEs, we also have the symmetry groups, even now in a, in a much nicer sense because every, all of the symmetry groups are predefined so we actually know how our data is, or how our nature is representing us the data. So I think the next step in this in this game will be to do the same as we did for Nashwan, to do for Fokker Planck, namely to bake in the symmetries and all our all our, all our dynamical problems to to operate better and longer and more robust on on mes meshes. And this brings me now to to the, the the way of how I look at traffic data. Because if we if we look at this challenge, we can interpret this this data as from the Fokker Planck point of view. So we have the data, um, we have snapshots of our x y coordinate system, and we have the um, the data or the traffic getting intense and less intense over the daytime. And this is basically exactly the way that our grid is fixed and the values of our grid are changing. So we're operating in the Fokker Planck point of view. And then we all know that. Traffic can also be like this, so that um, we have our, our system and, and, and um, cars move arbitrarily um, wild around. And this is practically the, the national viewpoint. And, and especially at this, in this scene, we really see that they are interacting with each other. And so the way I see traffic data is, is really as, as a, a nice way where we, you not only have the chance to to, 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 um, to challenge convolutional neural networks and graph neural networks against each other, but also to challenge these two points of view against each other and, and maybe combine them to get like a better, more robust model. Because in physics, in statistical physics, what is operate or what is working on the, on the particle level is also described later onwards in the microscopic level. And that is basically the, the end of my talk. And I'm pretty curious of, the, the solutions you have chosen to, to these problems. Well, Johannes, thank you very, very much indeed. So I can I can say my precipitations were not in vain. Thanks for this fantastic talk. We have actually some questions, which I will uh, quickly go to. I'll do that actually in slightly reverse order. The first question is from Anastasios Covelas. He asks, very inspiring talk. Thank you very much. I have two questions. Number one, if I use deep learning for translation and I do German to English and then the same English text back to German, I will not get the original text. So does that have the equivariance property? Any comment on this? I, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a nice way of thinking. I always think of the clip model where you have the, 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 um, the output of, of, of your uh, image and the output of your text basically. And then they, they kind of um, go through similar networks and, and somewhere in the networks, the representation should be, should be the same. Somewhere the network should know that, that the text of the, of the image represents the same as, as, the, as the image. And, and you can think of the, 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 the same way if you translate then a language to the other language, somewhere in your system, um, the language should be such in a, such an abstract way that the way of, of representation is the same, no matter if it's coming from German to English or from English to, to German. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, that's, I think, the way of, of how to, to build better language models. And I, I, I think I, people are doing this. To, to, <laughs> to, to, to force it basically to have this, this representation, which no matter from which side you're coming, it should give you the same. I, I, I like your, your answer. It should be the same meaning, right? Yeah. So, yeah, I, and I guess, yeah, the group is the cyclic group on two gener uh, with one generator, right? So go one way, other way, that's the group action. I'm guessing the group action is translation. 
Um, yeah, very, very nice answer. Um, second question he has is, if we compare movement of particles with movements of vehicles, what do you think are the main differences? Um, what about boundary conditions? What is their importance in defining the movements? I think you um, answered that. I think personally that um, the, the movement of the streets is um, in a sense harder to model because you have so much predefined like um, cars cannot go widely around you have to follow the roads so kind of you, you have to incorporate this into your network that um, that basically the, the way you, you update positions the way you update um, um, everything follows some some rules or some more like um, um, yes, some, some laws. But on the other hand, this gives you the chance to incorporate more um, into your, your networks. But mm -hmm. compared to, to the, the, the simulations we saw, here are definitely restrictions in the movement. Very nice. Um, there's a question from Christian Eichenberger. Uh, he also says, great talk, many thanks for the explanation and examples from a physics and chemistry viewpoint. You related your approach to traffic during the talk. Um, question number one, how would you have tackled this year's traffic forecast competition? Probably there's quite a few people who would like to know that. And then a uh, second question he has, um, how would you evolve the competition in order to apply your approaches? That's maybe also looking to what we should be doing in the future. Um, if we do yeah, that. so the, the, the question is, I, I think um, if you look at this, these, two, these two images, it's, it's very um, obvious what, what one has to do is, is looking at, and that's what all of you are doing, um, is looking at the, the data um, from, from a focus blank point of view. So, so the positions are fixed and the intensity of, of, of um, vehicles change over time. Um, it's it's basically the, the area where where convolution networks operate like extremely well. What I would be interested in is splitting this this um, this this input into like certain cells, like into sixty or thirty two cells, um, and and they like they are treated as, as nodes of a graph and interact with each other. Um, and this, like additionally to the to the standard way of, of, of processing the, the graph with, with convolution data, because with with that you might get the better or you might get the chance to, to model um, to, to let the, the lower right uh, the, the, the lower left bar um, um, like get to know what is going on in the upper right. But uh, I'm not sure if 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 I would would have. Um, any chance in this challenge. Um, it's, it's just what, what's personally interesting me. Very nice. Johannes, thank you very, very much again for, for this fantastic talk. Um, and um, yeah, I really, really, really enjoyed it. Thank you for having me. Uh, please, it was our, our pleasure. Uh, now we uh, move on. Our very own Christian Eichenberger uh, will tell us about the traffic forecast, competition design, and the data. Thanks, Michael. I'm happy to give you some more details on data and design in addition to what Sepp introduced, introduced already so nicely. In this part, we will come less from the ML side and more from the data collection and traffic domain side. Before yielding the floor to our participants and seeing their solutions, we try to give an overview of design and data to those new to the compet competition. But we also hope we can also shed a light on some new aspects for those knowing the competition for longer. And we will come back to many of the aspects covered here and the examples we, we took in, in this block in the discussions later um, and try to discuss um, the insights and the shortcomings of the current setup. So for encoding dynamic traffic data, we're using the traffic map movie format. Um, as we have already seen, this encoding aggregates raw GPS probe into a grid of approximately 100 by 100 meters with five minute frames. Volumes and speeds for all four major headings are encoded in eight channels. And each movie snapshot covers approximately 50 kilometers by 50 kilometers of urban area. So it's, it's, it gives quite a nice comprehensive coverage uh, of the whole um, of a complex city. Now to data collection, the data originate from a large fleet of ve vehicles and the data is provided by, by here technologies. These ve vehicles recorded their movements in multiple metropolitan areas. 
and uh, the data covers so uh, quite a diverse set of cities, both culturally and socially. So maybe some some further details on 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 the data, data collection. Um, the four heading, headings, that's the four quad quadrants you see um, at the bottom of, of the plot. So you have northeast, southeast, southwest, and, and northwest. Um, and the volume is captured, captures the number of pro po points recorded by the, um, by the vehicles. The values are capped bo both above and below and then mapped um, to, the, to an integer range. And the same applies for mean speed, which measures actually the average speed from the collected pro points. Maybe an important point here is if there were no GPS probes, um, speed um, in the data is actually um, represented by, by zero. And that's, that's a point we're coming back to later in the discussion. So maybe some additional aspects um, which are important in the uh, data collection process. The GPS recordings, because they come from, from um, um, vehicle fleets, they only re represent a subsample of the total traffic going on in a city. And they can have different frequencies and other temporal patterns um, depending on the city area um, and on the fleets which contributed to, to, to the data. In addition, there's, and these explanations, they, they also say why there is also a city bias. So between cities, there is different coverage um, by fleets of, of the road networks. And what's nice about the, the traffic map movie format, and that's something we, um, we exploited quite um, strongly in uh, preparing this, um, this, this summit, um, is we can visually explore um, the data by applying visual filters or static statistical aggregations. So I, I talked about, uh, about noise coming from, from subsampling. Um, so um, fleets rep representing just a subsample of the, of the whole traffic going on. There is obviously also noise in, in the tessellation we do. So in gridding uh, and in applying um, applying the four quadrants on, on the data and doing this kind of aggregations. So if there are some probes close to the cell or the heading boundaries, this can introduce uh, fluctuations in the data. And we've seen such phenomena um, in the data as well. In the four plots on the left, we show mean speeds for Berlin and we see um, the expected symmetry along the diagonal. So, we have northwest and southeast, um, where the same area are, are colored um, quite alike. On the right hand side, you see a small um, example um, when zooming in on the road network. And there you see the, um, uh, the traffic, um, the, the streets with their directions. And obviously, um, GPR probes going along this graph has to be mapped. Um, onto the onto the four quadrants and into the grid, so this introduces um, interesting properties. Some more on on the the road graph um, we we added this year to make the this also the spatial transfer possible. So on, on the left hand side you see um, a grayscale picture um, of the city road road graph. And in the center, you see um, a sort of a connectivity um, between those cells. So um, for all the cells you see on, on the left-hand side, <coughs> in the right-hand side, uh, an edge um, says the two, the two cells are connected. And this center, um, this, this represent, representation in the center um, has been derived from the high-res grayscale city map we see on the right-hand side. So um, we took that image and um, derived a graph representa representation from that. And we hope we can, in the later discussions, we can see whether that added um, to being able to do the transfer. Now coming to the two um, challenges we set up. Um, Seth has already introduced that. Um, so 
some some further examples of of the domain shift which we are interested in so the first one is the COVID-19 pandemic coming in well, we see here two two cities Istanbul and New York we have the blue lines representing volumes before COVID and um, the orange line representing volume over the day over one day uh, over one day um, of our data um, during during COVID so we see um, the, the curves are quite similar, but at lower volumes. What we also see um, uh, for, for Istanbul, um, the morning peak we see, we see more to the left um, is, more, is, is less prominent. And in New, New York, it seems to have gone um, completely. Now let's have a, look, a more detailed look um, into into that and not not only looking at at volumes over the daytime but also looking at speed so that's the um the, the red curves here so we have on the left hand side um we have um three before COVID situations um so three locations um, before COVID, and on the right the same locations one day of of data for the same locations in COVID. so um in 2020 so the first example um, on the top uh, is a highway in the outskirts of Berlin. So you see um, the, the general speed volume is quite high. Um, during night time, there is uh, there are some some um, there is missing data or there is no data. So there's there are quite a few spikes. And if you see uh, if you look at if you compare the, the two before and in COVID, you see again, the morning peak has almost completely vanished and the afternoon peak seems at least as prominent as, as before. So if you go to the second example, that's also a highway, but more in the city center. So there are speed limitations there, speed signaling, um, which um, reduces the, the max level or the free flow speed when there is um, small volume um, in, in this example. What you also see is during the daytime, and this happens in COVID and before COVID, there are some situations where speed goes down and, and volume goes up. Um, these are um, short um, traffic jams, which, which partially slow down um, the, the traffic that is going on. And what you also see is that there is um, much more coverage. So also during nighttime, um, we have um, we have we have more data points. So um, there is the, uh, the behavior is less spiky during the nighttime. And the third example um, um, is is a boulevard in the center of Berlin with business as well as housing. And here the two patterns look quite alike. So. Let's maybe go to the to the summary. We've already introduced the two the second challenge as well. So the second one is if you add um, if you add the static data, the, the map data, make does this make possible uh, transfer learning across cities where um, where we didn't train on those cities? So. Um, this picture lovely um, it, um, highlights the, the main points of the summarizes the two competitions. We have training data for four cities um, for both before and in COVID uh, with full coverage. We have the core challenge where we have only training data for before COVID um, and only train on the only test slots for um, during 2020. And we have the extended ch challenge where we don't provide any training data for the cities. So this should have given you uh, an introduction to the to our two competitions and hopefully um, there are some new insights to you as well. Thank you very much, Christian. Fantastic uh, analysis. Um, let's come to the to the meaty part of today's uh, proceedings. Uh, let's have a look at the solution. So the first uh, speaker up is Sungbin Choi. He actually got the second prize in our core competition and the first prize in our extended competition. And the title of his talk will be Applying Unit for the Traffic Map Prediction Across Different Time and Space. Sungbin Choi, floor is yours. 
Oh, so uh, I'm now I'm going to present my experiment uh, applying UNET for this trapping back prediction task. Uh, so uh, the input uh, regarding input, there was uh, uh, dynamic data uh, which changes over time uh, and static data which does not change over time. Uh, uh, and there was also this year, there was a high resolution static data was given, but I didn't use it. So uh, regarding dynamic data, there was a 12 previous time frame traffic map was given and each pixel has a traffic volume and speed to picture channel with for each direction. So there are eight picture channel and uh, I, I haven't used any uh, recurrent model for this task. So simply the time axis was merged into the picture channel. So uh, in regarding dynamic data, there was 96 picture channels. And in static data, there was a uh, nine picture channel. Uh, combining those data, uh, we have input of uh, 105 picture channel. And uh, so we need to predict then uh, six future time frame, and each pixel has eight picture channels. So we'll make 48 output channel predictions. Uh, so basically, I used UNET, and uh, the model was trained uh, using the mean squared error loss function. Uh, which is same as the evaluation measure for the test set. Uh, the model was trained using Adam optimizer, and uh, uh, I I uh, apply I tried four different model structures for the unit. Uh, it is named as model A, B, C, and D. Uh, so in the unit, there is a downsampling pass, downsampling blocks and upsampling pass, and there's interconnection between them. Uh, inside the down block, uh, there are three convolutional layers and they are uh, densely connected with each other, uh, inspired from the dense net. And after each downsampling block, it is uh, uh, downsampled by uh, average pulling layer. Uh, so it uh, image size is held in size. And in model B, uh, it has a similar architecture with the model A, but simply the difference was the, when we doing the down sampling, the, uh, it was done by linear interpolation and the scale factor was set to 0 0.7. So in previous model A, uh, uh, practically it was scale factor was 0 0.5. So in this case, uh, if input was uh, 100, then output will be 70 in size. After that, uh, 49. So image is shrinked more slowly compared to the model A. And in model C, uh, uh, just one max pulling layer was added between the two convolutional layers and other, all other things are same as the model A. And in model D, uh, various convolutional and max pulling layers were applied. Then uh, it was, the output was added to the previous input. So I tried to implement uh, some kind of less net like structures for the model D. Uh, so this year's task has a call and extended task. Uh, in the call task, there was uh, four different type, four target cities. And uh, there were uh, eight different cities for the train set in total. And I trained uh, seven based on models for the call task. Uh, so I named it as T1, from T1 M1 to T1 M7. Uh, for the T1, uh, so model A, B, C, D was used at least once for the, this call task. Uh, and T1, M1, uh, the model was trained 
only from the target city. So if it was tested that is Berlin, that it, uh, the model is trained only from the Berlin. Uh, T1M2 is same as T1M1, actually uh, acquired from the same training, but it, the model only has a different iteration number. Uh, in T1M3, uh, in this case, uh, I trained initially modeled from uh, arbitrary city in Moscow, then, tra then uh, trained, moved the model to the train on the target train set. Uh, what I was trying to do was like uh, uh, in other image classification task, uh, people use like uh, pre-trained image net pre-trained model to other fine tune them to other tasks. So I try to do the same thing, kind of transfer learning, but the output uh, test, test set evaluation score did not look like uh, uh, performance was improved at all, but uh, I included it anyway. Uh, from T1M4 to T1M7, uh, the, all the ACDs were combined and used as a train set. Uh, actually, I, uh, this is my third participation of the challenge, but uh, last, for the last two years, I also tried these methods, uh, combining, uh, until the last year, there were three CDs. So I combined three CDs, train set, and tried to train the model, but uh, at that time, it was clear that the performance from the trained from the three CD were inferior, lower than the uh, model trained from uh, only the target train set. So I didn't I didn't uh, try it for the uh, final uh, model. But this year, the uh, evaluation score looks comparable to the models trained from the target city only data set. So I tried these included these models for, the, for my final submission. Uh, so uh, these seven models output was uh, simply uh, combined by averaging. And my best score uh, for the core task was uh, uh, 48.49 according to the mean squared error measure. Uh, for the extended task, uh, in this case, the target city was New York and Vienna, and uh, no training data for the target city was given. So the all A cities train set was combined and used as the train set. Uh, for the extended task, I trained four different base models. Uh, uh, T, model A, model structure A and C was used. Uh, T2M2, in T2M2, uh, I tried, uh, I trained, I tried to uh, do some uh, data augmentation technique, which is horizontal and vertical image flipping. Uh, this is pretty uh, common method, common data augmentation method, uh, commonly used in other image classification tasks. But uh, I tried it before in uh, previous years, comp previous years, this competition, but it didn't look like it's helping performance for this task. But uh, for the extended task, I used it, I tried it anyway. And regarding T2M4, uh, in this case, uh, the model, uh, I applied some uh, loss weight for each CD. Uh, if you see the right lower side of the slide, uh, this is the loss weight I tried for each city. And this, these values were arbitrarily set. Uh, no, no justification is there. I just said it uh, based on like, uh, uh, if we see this loss weight, uh, Barcelona's loss weight is set to 1.0. And Moscow's loss weight set to 0 0.25. Uh, the reason was that uh, generally the loss value from the train set uh, from Moscow was four times bigger than the Barcelona. So if we train model uh, simply combining those all eight cities, then I was worried that maybe uh, the model could be biased uh, to the 
the data from Moscow has more effect to the final output and effect from Barcelona is too low. So I wanted to somehow balance out those effects from per each city. Uh, but the evaluation score from the test set does not look like there's a some meaningful difference, but uh, I included it as a final model anyway. So I finally used four different models and it was again combined by averaging and my best score from the public test set was uh, 59.55. Wow, that's actually very nice. Amazing solution. Thank you very much indeed, Sungbin. I have to confess, I have lots of questions, but maybe we keep that for the for the end of the day when we have a, a broader discussion. Um, yes. Let's move to the uh, next talk from the third prize uh, winners of our core competition with the title Solving Traffic Forecast Competition with UNET and Temporal Domain Adaptation. Um, the talk will be given by three people now. I, I hope I will not uh, butcher your names, and if I do, please uh, apologies. It's, I think, uh, Seva Konyakin, Nina Lushin, uh, Lukashina, and Alexei Spielmann uh, from ITMO University, JetBrains Research, and HSE University, respectively. I yield the floor to you. Yeah, uh, thanks so much. Uh, great introduction. As, as already mentioned, we were only focusing on the core, core challenge, and uh, here in this talk, I'll present our third place solution to the challenge. Um, so our main contributions were as follows. Uh, we first build and train the um, four independent unit models that serve as a baseline uh, for, the, for the challenge, which later turned out to be very hard to beat. Um, then we employed different um, encoders to the um, above mentioned um, unit. Um, the encoders were pre-trained on ImageNet. And then we also explore a set of domain ad adaptation techniques in the sense that we want to find the um, the temporal shift that was present in the in the test um, subset, and then we also um, research. Um, well, we also try different assembling methods to combine different networks and the domain adaptation techniques um, to create the best scoring submission. Um, so, speaking of the baseline unit, uh, we first split the 2019 data into four folds, uh, leaving one fold out for validation on 2019 data. We then train four independent unit models for each of the core city. And we also, for this one, we experiment with the post-processing mask because we, well, um, as a prior knowledge, we know that um, we cannot drive off-road. And then we try to uh, post-process our predictions um, to make data more sparse in a sense the prediction is more sparse. So we experiment with a static mask from the from the road craft. Um, we also experiment with the mask update from the 2019 training data. And the idea is very simple. If pixel has ever been not zero, we set the mask value to one, otherwise to zero. And also we um, experiment with the mask update from the 2019 training data and 2020 test data together. Um, so uh, as, 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 as you can see, um, over the test uh, leaderboard, the, the best post-processing function was to uh, combine the 2019 training data and uh, 2020 test data. Uh, so we later on fixed this post-processing function for all our later submissions. And uh, one, one other important thesis here is that um, UNET is a very simple yet strong baseline that turned out to be very hard to beat. Um, so furthermore, we tried experimenting with employing the pre-trained encoders on the ImageNet. I think that was also um, part of, um, um, of, of the other um, compet competitor solutions. Um, so we employed, we tried with efficient NetB5 and DenseNet201. Uh, the, the idea to use this one was uh, rather uh, empirical. It was, uh, the idea was to match the number of parameters for the, um, with the original UNET model. Um, so again, we um, we, we tried this two encoders. We trained four cities, four models independently for four cities. Um, and we, um, it, it turned out that the performance on the validation of, um, on the validation data on 2019 data was better for the, uh, for the, for the new models. However, um, on the 2020 domain, um, the models were, uh, the performance of the models were a bit worse. 
meaning that the these models were less robust to the to, to the shift in 2020. So we decided to kind of experiment with domain adaptation techniques to maybe um, better use the uh, the uh, uh, let's say more sophisticated models with the uh, pre-trained encoders. So the domain adaptation techniques that we tried were pseudo labeling. Um, the idea of the pseudo labeling is very simple. You just uh, so you uh, label the test data with the with the predictions of the model and then um, kind of fine tune the model in its own predictions. However, the performance seems to have been degrading and we explained that basically that with the 2020 test data, the temporal domain shift is also present in the output maps themselves. Um, so that's why we tried something which is rather heuristic, but uh, we found it very effective in a sense. So we, we called it temporal domain adaptation. And the idea is to kind of bridge the 2020 test data to the 2019 training domain. And uh, we did it uh, simply just by calculating the mean traffic map per year, which is essentially a 3D tensor, encoding the traffic in, um, in each of the pixel and also in the channel of the traffic map. So um, we calculate this mean traffic map for 2019 training and 2020 test data for each of the city. And then we use this as a relation to calculate the transformation from 2019 to 2020 test data and uh, and use this relation as a pre-processing function as post-processing function for our inference. Um, simply said, um, so how, how does it look in practice is that once first we have um, 12 input frames, um, just representing, I guess, the volume by four volumes combined. So we first imply the temporal domain adaptation, somehow bridging the, um, so if, if this is the 2020 des test data, we want to bridge it to the 20 2019 data, since our models for, were trained on 2019, we apply this temporal domain adaptation, then we do the model inference. And then, um, and, and then at the end, we apply the inference relation, inference domain, temporal domain adaptation to bring, to bridge the, the, the predictions back from 2019, kind of to 2020. Um, so, and at the end, um, since we had um, different models and uh, different um, domain adaptation techniques, it was worth trying to just assembling all of that together and uh, hoping that it will get better performance on the test set. Um, so essentially what we did is that we had the assemble, assemble um, of the three models and uh, the ensemble of the three models with the temporal domain adaptation technique that I just discussed. Um, and then having these two, two ensembles, you can also ensemble the two together and get our final predictions. Um, so speaking of the results, uh, here is the, the first, first line is representing the, the three model ensembles with the temporal domain adaptation. And the second one represents just the model ensemble together. And then just by combining the two, we get the best results so far. So maybe, well, the, the best result that we achieved. So maybe the idea is that temporal domain adaptation was a bit harsh and then the truth with the um, bridging the data is somewhere in between. Um, yeah, so I think that's it for our solution. Thanks thanks so much for, for your attention and for the competition organizers actually as well. Very, very nice solution. Well, thank you for participating and very creative uh, way of solving it. There's another question. There was also a question from so, to Sum Bin. Uh, maybe very quickly, great insight, Seva, and congratulations for your third prize. Interesting domain adaptation approaches. Do I understand it correctly that the temporal domain adaptation kind of represent, represents a weighted mask for the translation from 2019 to 2020? Um, yeah, I think it's it's, a, it's another way to put it. So basically, mm -hmm. if you think of it, there is a pixel in 2019 representing the traffic. Um, we kind of maybe want to... Um, there is an idea that in 2020 the average traffic was uh, was less than in 2020 uh, 2019. So we just want to find the coefficient that maps this pixel um, in 2019 2020 and backwards. Well, once you know the coefficient, you can map it backwards from 2020 to from 2019 to 2020. Nice. So I think the answer is yes. Very nice. Fantastic. There, there are more questions. I hope in the interest of time, everyone, maybe we can get a bit of uh, space later to, to discuss them. I think they're all great. I have a hundred, <laughs> um, but let's maybe, I hope you, you, you're still around, um, uh, Seva, and then we can, we can maybe do that. Um,
Let's go to the uh, third prize of the extended challenge. Uh, the title of the talk is Traffic Forecasting on Traffic Movie Snippets. Um, that's from Nina Wiedemann. Uh, the team was Nina Wiedemann and Martin Raubol, and they are from MIT Lab and ETH Zurich. Nina, I yield the floor to you. Um, yeah, thanks for the introduction. Yeah, I'm from the Mobility Information Engineering Lab at ETH, and I would like to present our approach for the Traffic Forecast Challenge, uh, which was based on processing movie snippets of these traffic movies. So the idea is to not process these traffic movies as a whole, but rather to split them into patches and then to process the, the patches and merge the predictions in the end. Um, why do we want to do this? Well, um, we were particularly interested in solving the extended challenge, um, so to generalize to new cities. And our idea there was that it is not necessary to input a whole street network of, like to, to train on a whole street network of another city, when at test time, the street net network will be, uh, of, of course, completely different. Um, therefore, also as a second reason, uh, to predict one pixel in the city, it would probably not be necessary to input also a pixel that is at the opposite side of the city. Um, so therefore, we, might, uh, we thought it might be better to train on regions of the city. Um, apart from this, however, this patch-based approach has several other advantages. Um, first of all, um, as you all experience probably when uh, working with this data, it's of course very high dimensional, the, the original input. And this of course leads to long training times if you don't have a lot of GPUs and uh, also if you don't have uh, a lot of memory, then uh, you need to use a very low batch size and, and so on. So um, it can of course improve performance just that you reduce the dimensionality of the data and kind of have a divide and conquer approach. And last, another nice advantage of the method is that we, if, if we at test time um, make the patches be overlapping, we get several predictions for one pixel. So this leads to kind of an ensemble in itself because we can average these predictions. Of course, this idea is not new in computer vision. Um, I've found several papers in different applications, including, for example, natural image segmentation, uh, tumor segmentation, uh, brain images, and uh, even tree bark classification. And what these works usually do is then, in the classification example, um, you summarize the predictions afterwards in a majority voting, um, or in regression tasks, you just uh, can summarize by averaging the predictions. So now I want to go a bit more into detail in, in our approach. Um, so at training time, we just randomly sample patches from the original data. So uh, what we actually do is we cache always several days of training data and then randomly sample uh, certain time slots and locations in the, pet, uh, in the images. And these patches are then um, fed through our uh, unit plus plus. Um, there are three reasons why we use a unit plus plus. Uh, first of all, as we've already heard, um, the unit was a very strong, um, is a very strong baseline that was used in, in the last years. And uh, secondly, the unit plus plus is a success zone was shown superior in, in different applications. Um, also, we thought that since the traffic data is highly regular over time, um, it might be useful to have these additional skip connections. So the main difference of unit plus plus compared to unit is that there are more skip pathways, as you can see in this image on the right. And on these pathways, there are further convolutional layers, um, which are the green uh, points here. Yes, so this is what we do for training. Um, and then at test time, we take the city, the, the new cities, and we split them in like a grid-wise manner now. Um, so this leads to a, another parameter, which is kind of the stride with which we kind of convolve the images. Um, so you can imagine that we can move this window in a different uh, step size. And if this step size or stride is lower, we get even more um, patches per pixel and therefore more predictions, which we can uh, average in the end. I directly want to jump now to our results on the leaderboard. So this is copied from the performance on the test data. And the first thing we observed is that the unit plus plus um, converges faster. So here on the bottom right, you can see um, a test that we did on a validation data set. So um, this validation data set is just a city that was left out during training. So we try to simulate uh, the test uh, situation. And also here in our scores, you can see that uh, with the same uh, amount of epoch, at least, um, the mean squared error of the unit plus plus was uh, significantly lower. Um, 
The second thing is then that we uh, tried our approach with a patch size of 100 times 100 pixels. And then in test time, we used a stride of uh, 50 pixels. Um, so as you can uh, imagine from the slide before, is that this is half of the patch size. So therefore, for each uh, pixel, we get um, at least four predictions, except for pixels at the border, of course. And this um, improves the results for both the unit and the unit plus plus. Then, of course, uh, we asked um, what is the best patch size? So we tested different um, sizes of, of these patches. But we observed that if we make the patch size even lower, for example, 60 times 60 pixels, we got um, always worse results. So this hints at the fact that maybe uh, a certain size is necessary in order to predict the traffic uh, one hour into the future. And uh, last, um, our final best submission on the leaderboard um, was the same model as uh, this one, like the 100 times 100 patch size with a 50 stride. But now we use a stride of 10, such that we get even more predictions per pixel. And this last fact we wanted to explore more into detail. Um, and what we did here is also on the validation set again, we varied this uh, stride. So we used the same model as our best performing model, but just the test time use a different stride varying from 100 to uh, 10 um, pixels. And um, you can see that there is a clear decrease um, of the mean squared error. But on the other hand, as you can see on the y-axis, the uh, change is rather marginal. So um, we can't see a, a high improvement uh, with this averaging. And we conclude from this that the advantage of our method is not really lies, there's not uh, more in the, uh, in the ensemble type behavior, but it's rather just the patchwise processing and the, um, yeah, the division of the problem into sub problems. Um, last, another idea that uh, we had was that maybe averaging the predictions in the end is maybe not the best method for aggregating um, the predictions. Um, and one hypothesis is that we had is actually that if a pixel is more central in one patch, then the predictions of this particular patch can be better than if the pixel is in the very corner of, of this patch. So the idea is that if, uh, like in one patch, a pixel is, is in the center, we can use all information that are around uh, this pixel and we can get a better prediction. And to see if this hypothesis um, is true, we uh, compared three different methods to aggregate predictions. One is just our baseline of uh, just taking the average. The second is just to take the one patch where the pixel is most central. And the third one is to uh, do a weighted average and to make the weights proportional to the centrality of the pixel. So uh, again, uh, just in other words, um, we do the same as before. We, we just uh, take a certain stride and um, get several predictions per pixel, but then we make a selection of each, for each pixel, which predictions we actually take. Um, but uh, the average performed best of out of these three. The weighted average is um, similar, but uh, at least it doesn't give any increase in performance. And um, yeah, we conclude from this that this hypothesis is not true. Um, apparently, centrality doesn't play a role, at, at least for our model. Um, however, there might be other smart ways to, to do this summarization or aggregation of the predictions. For example, these weights could also be, be learned. That's something else that could be tried. So what we conclude from this is that um, patchwise processing has several advantages. At first, um, first we, we could see from our performance of our model that it seems to better generalize to new cities. And uh, secondly, it has uh, it leads to faster training time. And we get this ensemble like output averages, um, which also has some nice properties, for example, that we can compute a standard deviation. So as, uh, as a side fact, I also thought about for this special price um, where you can uh, where we should try to predict um, or where the focus was on um, certain unseen situations or uh, abnormal situations, there I thought maybe the standard deviation of the predictions is higher in these situations. So this would be something that's also maybe interesting to explore. Um, and then also we conclude from uh, this work that um, it might not be necessary to compress all cities into a predefined raster. 
So the way the data is given is that, of course, kind of Vienna is kind of made uh, similar to New York and compressed into a raster of the same size. And if a patch-based processing is better anyway, then it might not be necessary or even a disadvantage to do this. Um, also, we think that um, our approach together with other approaches might achieve the best performance. So it would be really interesting to try this approach with the models um, proposed, for example, in the talk before by uh, Sungbin Chai, or uh, also with a graph neural network. So this approach is general and is not dependent on the network architecture, of course. Um, also, we did some uh, further error analysis and we think it might be interesting in, in further work to um, focus on the, on the loss function, uh, such as to use some masking techniques and um, also maybe to develop methods that are particularly useful for dealing with this sparse data. So this is uh, the problems that we observed with our model that uh, this could be quite uh, hard for the model. Um, I want to thank my uh, collaborators and colleagues at the MIE lab. And uh, there are some re resources on the left side uh, to our links to our website and the code. And uh, I'm looking forward to your questions and to hear the solutions of the other participants. Well, thank you very much, Nina. Thought-provoking work and uh, would be fantastic if we could, could explore that. Let me go through some um, questions for all you three. So for Sungbin, for uh, Seva and for you, Nina. Um, I'll, I'll try and, and, and do it fairly in order a bit. So there's actually a lot of questions coming in. Uh, I'll start with you, Sungbin, if you can hear me. A uh, question is from Christian Eichenberger. Congratulations for your performance in the competition and many thanks for presenting. Did I understand you correctly that the ensemble in the core competition differ for each city? Uh, so that's your T1M1, T1M2, T1M3. Whereas what you used in the extended competition is fully city independent. Uh, oh, and then, yes. hello. Uh, okay. Yep. So uh, the my in my method in the core core task, uh, T1M1 to T1M3. Or uh, your question is right. I used the uh, uh, I trained the model for each city, so there are four model in the core task in T1M1, T1M2, T1M3. And uh, in the extended task, uh, uh, the model was a uh, totally city independent. Okay, very nice. Yes. And then does that then mean this again from Christian in the core competition ensemble, did you use per city model only in T1M1? Does this mean you trained four versions of T1M1? Uh, yes, that's correct. Very nice. Thanks very much, Sungbin. Um, then I go to the next question for you, Seva from Christian Eichenberger. Congratulations for your prize and thanks for the nice presentation. You applied a TDA technique. Uh, did, you in, uh, did you inspect in detail where it helped to improve the solution quality? No, I think it, it's something that I'm, I'm lacking for sure. Uh, maybe it, it would be interesting to see actually, uh, maybe at which regions that this helps and uh, in which regions uh, mm -hmm. it, it doesn't help or maybe I can boost it, maybe selecting the pixels um, where we need to apply this one or not. But it's very interesting, right? Because you could then all of a sudden predict which pixels it helps or not. So in general, you could think that if you just learned to train the model on non uh, uh, domain shifted data, your domain shift adaptation comes in the TDA, if you like. Yeah. Okay, so uh, um, maybe, yeah. maybe soon yeah. been. Yeah. <laughs> We can take one of your models off the shelves. Fantastic. Um, Nina, I have a question from you from, from Moritz Neun. Great insights, Nina, and congratulations to your third prize. The patch base approach is really inspiring. On your centrality analysis, would this mean that the model and the patches did not really learn rules that would be more prominent in the central cell, e.g. like the flows leading to and through a patch? Um, yes, so it, it seems like it. I would say that um, it's, I mean, I wouldn't say that um, it did not learn any any rules. I would say maybe the rules are just not dependent on the centrality, right? So it might, um, it might just be that, for example, if um, a pixel is in a corner, but this corner is, all, is, is anyways the direction where there's not much traffic and all this traffic comes from the upper right, then maybe it might be better just to use this patch because there's more information on the upper right than and like I mean this assumption that there's most information if the pixel is most central is probably in a city not always true or hardly ever true mm -hmm. so I think this is what um, I would take from this at the moment but I mean I still think that 
it might learn different, uh, different things. I mean, there is some variations between the predictions. And um, I, I think, for example, if one could learn these weights, for example, it could depend on the street network that in some regions it might be better if the pixel is at a certain, like one patch might be more important than the other patches, and this could be learned. But for this, of course, we would have to have training data from the same city. Do you think that like when you say the, the patch size you actually considered, I mean, you could translate it if it's rough, roughly 100 by 100 meters, then it's, uh, you see that I don't get the power of Tenrong. Uh, we, we are then looking at 10,000 meters, basically, so uh, uh, 10 kilometers. So I guess that that means, um, do you think that means that if you go to a smaller patch for one hour prediction, there may be effects in the traffic further away from that that play into that and hence the performance decreases. And do you see difference, differences between cities um, where maybe the speed is lower or so on? Um, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I, I mean, I just saw this decrease in performance. So um, I think it uh, could be due to missing informa information basically that um, like other parts that are further away um, are better to predict the results. Um, I mean, for one hour, you can also imagine that uh, 10 kilometers do play a, play a role, right? I mean, there's more travel that it goes more than, than 10 kilometers far. And maybe again, if we take the example of um, people going home from work, um, it might be that, uh, yeah, that some activity starts further away. And then if, if the model sees this activity that starts at 5 p.m., um, really far away, it can already conclude about some activity in this region one hour in the future. But of course, this already assumes a really good performance of the model. So I'm not sure if the model, model can, can actually do this. And, okay. and regarding differences between cities, um, I'm not sure, but I also haven't, um, have to, haven't tested this qualitatively or observed any, any differences. Maybe one last question for me, so to, to, to blog is very interesting. Um, how do you treat the edges? Because obviously there you don't slide your thing over as, as much and you don't get as many averages. Did you consider maybe like starting outside the domain and it needs to learn it or? Um, yeah, I mean, I also zero padded the inputs as it was done in the, um, in the code that was already published. Um, but apart from that, I didn't take special care on these. Also, because I observed that um, in the borders, actually, the predictions are zero a lot of the times anyway. So in almost all of the cities, the borders are, um, they are very sparse. So I think they don't, I mean, I just observed that they don't contribute much to the mean squared error. So I didn't take special care of them. Very nice. Thank you. Any further questions, anyone? Because if not, then keep them and we can hopefully do them a, a bit later. And let's go for the next great talk. We had a, a, a submission we liked very, very much about uh, with the title of large scale traffic prediction using 3D ResNet and sparse UNet. That's from Bo Wang Reza. And apologies if I mispronounce your name here, Moharia Poor, uh, Chen Chai, Ini Kim, and Hai Wu from Monash University, CSRO's Data 61, Kongju National University. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Bo Wang, uh, PhD student at Monash University. Uh, it's my pleasure to present our work proposed for Traffic Forecast 2021. Uh, our topic is about large-scale traffic prediction using 3D ResNet and sparse UNet. Uh, this work has been finished with my uh, supervisors. Riza and Chen at the uh, uh, CSIRO's Data System One, uh, Professor Inke Kim and Professor Hai Wu at uh, Monash University. So today I will present the work with three sections, background, methodology, and uh, conclusion. So all tasks in this year uh, belong to the time series forecasting problem. Uh, our uh, the participants are supposed to use 12 uh, time steps to predict the following six in the next hour. So for each particular time step, we have corresponding image-like tensor that represents the traffic information. Uh, w and H are the width and height of the city map. And the I re represents the traffic speed and flow in four directions. 
So there are uh, two different challenges set for spatial and uh, temporal domain shifting. Uh, since the corresponding training data for these scenarios are not accessible, so uh, our strategy is to train a model that can be generalized for these testing situations. So data augmentation should be the most common method to uh, increase the uh, ability of generalization. Uh, but uh, the tricks we tried, uh, such, uh, such as image cropping and uh, image rotation, uh, uh, were not working very well. Uh, I think this is because uh, this is time series data. If we treat them uh, like cropping, then their inner relationship will be changed. Uh, so the question uh, becomes how to better utilize the existing training data set uh, because uh, all available data sets are very large. Uh, it's very time consuming to train them completely. Uh, therefore, we have proposed a, a custom plan to prepare the training data. Uh, in each training epoch, uh, we actually pick up limited files to examine the learning process of our model. Among these files, uh, all cities uh, will be selected for the spatial diversity, and all different days of the week are selected for the temporal diversity. In other words, we hope to increase the model generalization by creating the most representative samples in every training epoch. Furthermore, to uh, improve the speed of data loading, we have created a custom sampler for the data loader. Uh, to make, it, make, make this clear, we have prepared an example. Assume that we have three training files. Uh, each of them contains five samples. So in PyTorch, we can uh, write something like this, uh, batch size equal to three and uh, shuffle equal to two. Uh, then the data loader would shuffle all available samples and return three indices every time. Uh, however, uh, if the indices are just like, like this in this simple batch, one, seven, and 13, if the indices point to different files, then we need to load multiple files, even for this one batch. This is very time consuming. Uh, on the other hand, our method first uh, shuffle the order, order of the files, uh, just like this one. File one, two, three becomes file three, one, two. Uh, then we shuffle the original indices in each file as well just like this way, uh, the, the, uh, the original sequential indices will be randomly shuffled. So uh, the final batches will be uh, loaded sequentially based on this new order, just like this way, the third batch. So by catching these files when uh, loading this, uh, these files in the memory, we can uh, improve the uh, data loading speed from uh, two batches to 60 batches, which is 30 times faster. Uh, in terms of forecasting models, we have explored two approaches uh, for this competition. The first one is based on 3D convolution. Compared to the uh, 2D convolution widely used uh, in previous years and this year. Uh, the, the 3D kernels can actually move across three different uh, dimensions, just like this way. We believe this operation can learn more complex spatial temporal features in the hidden layers. Uh, therefore, we propose the resonant structure using 3D convolution. It uses padding to remain the original map size uh, through all hidden layers. 
Also, we used a, a consecutive residual uh, blocks to increase the depth of the neural network. As a result, uh, this model has achieved a, a fifth place for the core challenge. The second model is called the uh, sparse unit. Uh, it was inspired by the sparsity of the given data. Uh, for example, we have randomly picked uh, three time steps from Melbourne city here. Uh, it was a busy morning. The study area is 495 by 436. However, uh, we can see that these colorful points, only about 1,400 cells are not zero, uh, which means only zero point uh, six four percent grids of all available positions and if we perform uh, a convolution through this sparse inputs just like this way then the majority of our results would be zero only therefore uh, we we have introduced a, a sparse convolution for this task uh, compared to the regular convolution, it uh, converts the non-zero data points into a big list, then performs the convolution on these related areas only. So based on this feature, uh, we propose a UNET structure using a sparse convolution uh, because UNET is a strong baseline. Uh, but for this one, it's, it's quite... Uh, simple, just uh, six hidden layers, contains uh, up, uh, down sampling and the uh, up sampling layers. As a result, uh, the sparse unit can speed up the modeling speed for six times uh, compared to the same structure that using, uh, that using 3D convolution layers. Although this method requires uh, much less computation resources, uh, it, it still achieves competitive result on extended challenge. Uh, but in practice, we found that this uh, the convert speed of this method uh, was very fast. Uh, however, it tends to overfit the training data for the core challenge. Uh, we don't know the exact reason behind, uh, behind this but we hope to solve this problem in future studies. Moreover, uh, we have explored the performance bottleneck of our models. Uh, we found that our models are suffering from the spatial inaccurate problem. Uh, our two models tend to predict the average values of six target time steps rather than the actual uh, sequential changes of the traffic flow. Uh, apparently, uh, given the MS, MSE loss, uh, forecasting the average value is much easier than this uh, local sequential change. Uh, and we believe this problem can be solved by proposing more advanced optimization methods. Finally, please allow me to conclude this presentation. We have proposed uh, uh, 3D resonant and the sparse unit for this computation, and they have achieved competitive result in both accuracy and uh, computation efficiency. Uh, there are also there are several uh, potential research directions can be explored in the future. Uh, firstly, uh, the study of sparse convolution for the regression problem is still in an early stage. Uh, their inner mechanism, structure design, and the model uh, generalization still need for further investigation. Secondly, uh, through our experiments, we found that uh, with different uh, traffic samples, the different uh, approach of convolution uh, can, be, can lead to very different results. So the future study could consider the strengths of different types of convolutions and make appropriate combinations. 
Certainly, uh, just like uh, Dr. Brand Stetter said before in, in his keynote, uh, there are some studies in using a uh, neural network uh, discovering the laws of uh, physics, the dynamics. Uh, this direction could also be applied to our existing models uh, by considering the theory of dynamic traffic flow. Finally, our current results are still limited uh, due to the temporal repeating uh, problem. More advanced metrics should be proposed to improve this issue. Our paper and uh, codes are also available online. Uh, please take a screenshot if you are interested. Uh, that's all of my presentation. Thank you very much for your listening. Any questions? Well, thank you very much for your great presentation. There are questions actually from uh, our very own Christian Eichenberger. Uh, many thanks, Christian writes, for the contribution in the competition and nice presentation. Did you use the static channels in your approach at all? Um, not in modeling, but I use the static information for masking the final results because apparently uh, some of the cells uh, will not have any traffic flow at all. So I just mask them off. That's it. Very nice. Very nice. Let me just check. I think for the moment there are no uh, further questions. If I. Oh, actually, there is. Sorry, from, from uh, Moritz Neun. Thanks a lot, Bo. Very interesting solution and great analysis. What model did uh, you use for your submissions to the leaderboard? 3D ResNet in core and sparse unit in the extended challenge? Or did you apply them differently for the submission? And he has a second question, uh, which is for the core competition, did you train a single model or, 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 one, city, uh, or one city per city? Or did you make use of the static road data? Uh, well, uh, we actually used uh, three uh, 3D resonant for the core challenge and the sparse for the extended challenge uh, because we found the best uh, performance can be achieved uh, from these uh, two models uh, independently. Uh, somehow our sparse unit uh, overfitted in for the for the core dataset. Uh, I'm not very sure about the reason. And for the second question, uh, yeah, I trained, uh, due to the limited time, I trained a single model, uh, like using all available data and prepare the custom uh, data in every epoch. So uh, we, we have picked uh, uh, several uh, checking points because during the training process, we have several, uh, the low MSE of the training data. So we just pick, pick up this point, uh, checking points and uh, make a prediction and uh, check which one is the best. Uh, actually, in the end, their, their performers are very close. And uh, uh, that's it. We just pick up the best one. That's very nice. So fantastic submission. And uh, thanks for, it for catching that. And uh, you came very, very close score-wise. So. Um, great, great methodology. I think it's also high time, Moritz. I hand over to you and Christian for the award of the special prizes. Um, let me just maybe say uh, one word before. And so to Moritz and Christian, thank you very much uh, for driving traffic forecast this year. Uh, I think without both of you, this competition wouldn't have been there. And then also to everyone again, of course, the competition is is really made by, by its participants. So except that we were bowled over by the um, submissions, the creativity of solutions, and uh, looking forward that maybe there's continued work. Moritz, I yield the floor to you. Thank you. Can I directly hand over to, to Christian? <laughs> so I'm going to make the start. Um, so in addition to the core and extended uh, competitions, um, we've invited all um, those the speakers of today to a spe special prize on anomalies. Because the most important and most difficult task is probably not to forecast traffic under steady conditions, but in anomalous situations, so um, in, in jam situations. And in, in the traffic forecast setting, we haven't done a lot on, on that yet. And in order to get a first hint of what could be going on in these situations, we devised a very simple heuristic 
to find such situations and then try to describe the model predictions both qualitatively, qualitatively and quantitatively in, in those situations. Um, so we didn't go about it with a lot of theory. Um, we didn't um, we didn't aim at being very general and finding all anomalous situations or categorizing them. We just wanted to find a set and then look into that to, to get us going in, in, in that area. So um, what we did um, was, um, was a trial and error process. Um, so we went about it um, by computing volume and speed quantiles and then filtering data on that. Um, we restrict ourselves to the daytime because we thought um, there would be enough data there and we would see uh, when traffic breaks down um, um, very clearly then. Um, then we, we, had a, we implemented a filter um, to, see, to find situations which take at least two time steps. And uh, there was a final tweak um, where we looked also at the, the, the volume and speed need over a two hour window. And the output um, of our procedure, um, one example you see, you see in the right. Um, so you see the horizontal dashed blue lines, which, uh, which represents the quantile. So the volumes in the gray area um, goes above, above that line and the speed goes below that line. So that's one of the filter criteria. And then we found the found the gray area, so um, um, which rep represents an anomaly found by our heuristic. Great. Uh, with this procedure, um, yeah, I think we we went on and uh, selected uh, a test set um, of one hundred of these outliers from the candidate set uh, identified. We chose uh, nine Thursdays in uh, September and October 2019 in Berlin and Istanbul. Uh, however, that this was in October 2019, that was not disclosed to the participants. Uh, so there was also no information whether this was uh, before in the in the COVID shift. Um, this and on the right hand side, you can see uh, the candidates basically which were selected there for the for the test set. And I think it's also no surprise. Uh, that they are mostly along uh, the highway where due also to the heuristic, but also due to in general having enough data to see to see like a clear distinction of before and after in, in such an anomalous situation. You, you can see that they are along the, along the highway. Um, and so basically for each of the tests, uh, we just looked at a, at a single pixel. Um, and uh, kept also for that basically the mask to then be able to uh, compute the MSE on them. And with that one, basically, uh, that was sent to the eight people which, which are also presenting today in the summit uh, to rerun their models on, on that data. So, and we asked them to once run it on the model as they used it for, uh, for the competition so far. And they were also free to do a second submission basically with a retrained model, but of course, without knowing what exactly uh, we were evaluating against. Um, so with that, we could actually, with the results we got from that, we could then go into a, a, a like more uh, quantitative evaluation. So the, um, by def definition, an outlier is restricted to one cell and one heading. So what we did, we, we defined a masked, um, an, a masked MSC, so which only looks at that cell and that heading, the two channels of that heading, and, and that differs for, for every, every test. So we had uh, 100 tests for, for Berlin and 100 for Istanbul, and the mask was different for, for all those tests. And amazingly, the leaderboard looks quite, um, quite familiar. Um, so if we look at both channels, um, we have um, Li Chao first, Sung Bin second, and um, Alati third um, with respect to that evaluation. Maybe one um, very striking thing here is if you look at the, the levels of, uh, of volume and speed MSC, so um, MSC for, for the, the volume and speed channel um, separately, then you see that the, the overall levels are quite quite alike. 
which is not at all the case um, if you look at the full map. So if you look at, um, at the core competition where we evaluated on the whole city, on the, um, the, whole, uh, on the whole grid, um, there, um, there is a very large uh, uh, asymmetry. So um, volume MSC is very low in contrast to, to speed. So after that, more quantitative, let's now also have a look at the prediction uh, uh, at a bit more uh, qualitative level. And we chose a few locations in, in Berlin. Uh, you can see them here, basically along that main uh, ring road, uh, which we also already saw earlier in the larger candidate, candidate map. And when we now dive back into, into that example pixel, this is basically now just on the top, you see uh, the plot uh, of the daytime curve for that specific pixel here. It's the test, the, the first, the very first test slots. Uh, the volume uh, is shown in the blue bar chart on the bottom and the speeds are showing uh, in, in the red line on the top. You, you will also notice uh, the few spikes. Uh, most of them are at nighttime, basically where there was a five minute start with no data, uh, no, no recordings. Um, and the heuristic uh, to identify an outlier found that situation in the afternoon peak hour basically. And here very prominently, the speed has gone down and uh, the volume has gone up. And um, <clears throat> Here, like uh, this might look a bit odd, right? Because it, it only highlights the second second part of the outlier here, um, which is already closer to the resolution of the gem. But nevertheless, that's actually interesting and interesting to look at. And if we look at, at the bottom uh, here, now we see the, just this tiny window. Uh, on the left-hand side, we basically see the crown truth as, as basically the volume uh, in blue and uh, the speed in red have evolved in the first hour, which was then the input to the model. And on the right hand side, we see uh, the, on the one hand in the, in the solid line, uh, still the ground roof and in the dashed lines, uh, what uh, uh, one example uh, a model basically was doing as, as a prediction. Um, and there you can see like uh, what the typical resolution strategy was there. One could say, yes, they, they do a good, good thing in, in, in balancing like the surface above and uh, below uh, the ground of which they have, have been doing here and trying to slowly, but more like steadily go back to, uh, back to uh, the level which, uh, which was there before. The second example, which, which we picked um, is a different, different pixel, but again, uh, along, along the, uh, the highway in Berlin. Um, here, the, the traffic jam after the gray bar, which we, which we are looking into uh, right now, doesn't fully resolve. Uh, and you can also see at the bottom, looking at, at the speed, but especially at the volumes that also in the hour, in the prediction horizon, there's again a spike and uh, like a bit something like a stop and go uh, traffic. Uh, so this is this is uh, really hard to predict in that horizon. And uh, um, here, like you can also see that the, the model are basically doing not such a good job, obviously because it's also hard to hard to anticipate that one could although uh, have anticipated or expected from some models to take neighboring pixels into account um, and to draw some conclusions out of that for the uh, for the upcoming uh, prediction horizon basically so if you look at different um, different predictions then there seem to be three types one we've seen already which seems to go back to the to the free flow speed, um, which seems to, to grasp that, and then other models which seem to go just to the mean of the of the input. Um, that's the second type, and the third type, uh, very strange models that jump to one value and then stay there for the whole prediction horizon. So, um, if you try to summarize, um, the best models seem to predict a smooth version of, of some jam re resolution over the prediction horizon. But they are fooled in, in, in cases where the jam doesn't resolve um, over the prediction horizon. So MSC probably makes some um, a, a 
blurred prediction um, to the mean in the data. And that's now for the, for the prices, Moritz. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that the insight is pretty interesting. And as Christian already said, that uh, the, the MSE didn't uh, or did, did also uh, favor a certain style. But if we look at it more from that, that qualitative aspect, uh, one cannot really say uh, which one is the best, best uh, resolution and best prediction for the, for the horizon. And therefore, we decided to uh, award no first prize, but instead award all seven participants with a 500 euro gift card. And so Christmas is close and we, we hope that uh, people will appreciate that. Uh, and Second to that, we, we hope and we invite everybody to participate uh, in the analytics and interpretability challenge. This is uh, something which you will learn more about in the, in the afternoon. Uh, uh, and we hope that you will, will do great additional stuff in, in that challenge. Thank you so much for participating, helping us with, with these insights and looking forward to continuing uh, with, with you hopefully on that journey. Thanks very much, everyone, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.